Good evening, everyone. James Olfer here with you. Glad you're with us. A word from the Lord coming to you. This is, well, I don't know what day it is, May something. Uh, May, what is it, 26th? 25th. Uh, can't keep track of time, but uh, and we're glad you're with us to study God's Word tonight. We want to. We're going to be using a topic that's in the news of late to be a springboard for our lesson tonight, but we want to give you our content information first. How to reach us, 276-340-2653 is my phone number. Word from the Lord at gmail.com is uh, how you can reach me by email. We'd be glad to hear from you and uh, I have a Bible study that way. Or if you'd like to, for me to come to your house or you can meet me somewhere, we'll be glad to study with you anytime we can. I want to invite you to come out and study with us on Sundays and Thursdays. Be our honored guest. We'll be glad to see you. You might know someone that you didn't know was a member of the Lord's Church who was attending there. And so we hope that you will. Uh, come out and be with us anytime you can. Uh, we meet at 250 the Boulevard in uh, Eden, and we hope that you will come out and visit with us if you're in the area. You know, they're saying time is a teacher. And uh, as you go through time, as time passes on, oftentimes you learn things that you didn't know at any given time. I mean, sometimes you might say, you might find yourself saying, I wish I knew then what I know now, you know, and so you look back in hindsight, you know, the old saying hindsight is twenty twenty. so you look back and you can see very clearly where you made mistakes or where you should have done something different, and so time is indeed a teacher. Job said it this way in Job 32 and verse 7, I said days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom, all right, so the idea is, yeah, it ought to be the case that that days should speak. The longer you're alive, it ought to show wisdom. But oftentimes, friends, we don't learn from, from time. We don't learn from time, the teacher, about what we should know. And sometimes I'm wondering how much are we really learning when you look at what's going on around us. You know, here's some articles that <clears throat> actually used uh, a number of years ago, back in 2005. And this has to do with what's going on in the world in regard to Islam. The whole world seems to be bending over backwards to tolerate the religion of Islam. I mean, doing things that they wouldn't do for anybody else, catering in such a way uh, that they wouldn't do to anybody else, giving them a pass in such a way that they wouldn't do to anybody else. But here's an article that says Muslim win uh, toy pigs ban. All right, so they're trying to ban uh, toy pigs. Here's the article. Novelty pig calendars and toys have been banned from a council office in case they offend Muslim staff. In case they do. You know, we're not, we don't know if they will or not, but just in case they do, we're going we're gonna to ban it. The article goes on to say that workers um, in the benefits department at Dudley Council, West Midlands, were told to remove or cover up all pig-related items, including toys, Porcelain figurines, calendars, and even a tissue box featuring Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. So yes, that's that's offensive. That was offensive back in 2005, I believe this was. Council Councilor uh, Ma Dubur Rahman, a practicing Muslim, backed the ban. He said it's a tolerance of people's beliefs. Now here's the thing. So they banned these these pigs, these toy pigs. And that's a tolerance for, uh, for Islam. But where is the tolerance that Islam has for someone else? I mean, is it really, is it, are you so hypersensitive that you see a pig, you see a porcelain figurine of a pig, or you see a Winnie the Pooh, uh, uh, what, tissue box, a box of Kleenex that had Winnie the Pooh on it, that you're going to be offended? You can't blow your nose on that tissue because it came out of a box that had, a, had the piglet on it? Really? So we're tolerating. Now here's my thing. Here's, here's my point. Are we, have we learned anything from this? Here is what was said in, in uh, uh, October 2005. And this is by the, uh, you know, the much beloved and, and highly thought of uh, Prince of England, uh, Prince Charles. And here's what he says. This, remember, this is 2005, October 2005. He says, uh, London... Prince, uh, uh, Prince Charles will try to convince President Bush of the merits of Islam this week because he thinks the United States 
uh, has been too intolerant of the religion since September the 11th, 2001. And everybody remembers what happened on September, happened on September the 11th, 2001. He says the prince raised his concerns when he met senior Muslims in London in November 2001. He said, quote, I find the language and rhetoric coming from America too confrontational. The prince said, according to one leader at the meeting, quote, his criticism of America was a general one of the Americans not having the appreciation we have for Islam and its culture, said Khalid Mahmoud, a Labor Party member of Parliament. Well, so he's proud of Prince Charles for saying, you know, America's too confrontational, we're too intolerant of Islam. Well, that's back in 2005. Now, friends, if you've been following the news, you know that the United Kingdom, Britain, uh, other countries in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, France and Spain, they've, they've been getting their share of Islam. You know, the peaceful religion. And this is why I'm saying, I wonder, have we learned anything over the past years? Have we really learned anything about the peaceful religion of Islam and tolerating it to the extent that we're saying, you know what, we've got to bend over backwards. We've got to do cartwheels and flips just to make sure that no one gets their feathers ruffled and not be too confrontational when we're talking about someone's religion. It's so near and dear we might hurt someone's feelings if we talk about their religion and tell them actually show some, something or say something that is contrary to what they believe. We've got to take away all the pig poo, uh, piglet uh, tissue boxes. You know, we've got to take all the figurines away. We can't, you know, we can't, you can't dare say bacon. That right there ought to be enough right there to tell you Islam's wrong. I mean, hey, you know, if you can't have bacon, something's wrong. But I digress. But have we learned anything over the past years? Have we really learned anything since 2005 where Prince Charles said, well, you know, America's too, too, too intolerant and too confrontational and we have a great appreciation for Islam. Well, I wonder if they have a great appreciation for Islam now. You know, just a few days ago, there in Manchester, uh, England, a uh, bomber, Salmani Abidi, I'm not sure if I pronounced the name right, took his twisted revenge out of love for Islam after being radicalized by ISIL preacher. That's right, friends. That's right. The, the country, the nation that's, that criticizes another nation for being too intolerant and too confrontational has just most recently gotten a taste of what it means when you, when you don't confront Islam, when you don't confront uh, this, this so-called religion. And it's really not a religion, friends. That's another uh, misconception. Islam is not a religion. It's not really, it's a it's a government. It's a form of government. You know, you might as well, you could put it up there with with uh, communism, socialism, fascism. You might as well put Islam up there because it's it's a government. It's a government under the disguise of a religion. But notice here they are, here they have this uh, the Muslim uh, the Manchester bomber. The Manchester bomber. Uh, did uh, did this act out of a revenge, out of a love for Islam, love for Islam. I want you to listen to the uh, the article here. Here's the article. This is from the uh, uh, United Kingdom Telegram. Uh, let's see if we can read some of this. I hope I can I, uh, got it large enough where I can read it here to you. And I can see that I do not. So let's just do this. I'll do one more. All right. Let me get this over here where we can. Uh, well, I just I just locked it there. All right. So we'll get it here in a minute. Uh, well, I'm just to tell you what the what the article said. And basically, it said that uh, he and his father took a trip over to Syria to fight in the uh, I'm assuming Libya 
took a trip over to Libya, their home home country, to fight against Gaddafi back in the uh, uh, the Arab Spring. You know, when Libya fell and everything was supposed to be great and fine and dandy and rosy because now we're getting rid of the uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and instead now Libya is, uh, you know, overrun by even more uh, radical Islam, Muslims. But I digress. So he goes over there, 16 years old, fights in this war, comes back radicalized, and now because uh, he's being upset because of the way uh, Muslims are being treated, who are blowing everybody up. So what does he do? He goes and he blows up this concert. Now, friends, this is what we're talking about. A love for Islam caused him to act upon it with revenge. Now, friends, that doesn't seem like a religion of peace. A religion of peace provokes you, teaches you, educates you to say, hey, let's go blow somebody up because I'm mad because you talked about me. You know what? I, I know there are some, you know, there are some uh, pretty crazy folks in religion out there that can get pretty irate. But I'm glad, I'm glad that, at least to this point, I'm glad there's no Methodist or, or, or Baptist or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Pentecostal suicide bombers out there. Because, man, boy, we did, the whole, whole uh, country would be blown up, wouldn't it? But see, there's something, have we learned from this? Yet we're saying, well, way back then we were saying, let's be tolerant, let's be tolerant. But now, now we're hearing, oh, you know, no, uh, I guess we're still being tolerant of them. I don't know. Let's, let's look at one more. Let's look at one more example have we learned from. Here's one. Fort Hood shooter plans a hunger strike to protest America's hatred for Sharia law. Now, you might remember this back in 2009. This is... Um, Nadal Hassan, Fort Hood, Texas, killed 13 people uh, in, a, in a shooting spree. He's a Texas Army psychiatrist. I think, he, you know, physician heal thyself would be the proper uh, quote here. But he went on a shooting spree, killed 13 people, shouting Allah Akbar. He's on death row now, finally, you know. It, here's his 2017, so we're, we're talking, what, six years later. Uh, no, uh, eight years later, eight years later, now he's on death row and he's going on a hunger strike to protest America's hatred for Sharia law. Well, have we learned anything from this? I mean, this is just one of many. We could talk about San Bernardino, California. <clears throat> we could talk about the Boston Marathon being blown up. We could talk about uh, uh, military recruiting officers being shot up. We could talk about uh, uh, other acts of terrorism that, at the time, our president, President Obama, was saying, well, workplace violence, workplace, really? Have we learned anything? Are we still trying to cover up the truth about the fact that Islam is a terrorist religion? Are we really trying to do this? Here's one more. I want you to look at this, at this list. This is a list and I'm not going to read all of it. I, I'm going to read quite a bit of it. But this is a list that I want you to take notice of. This is a listing of terrorist attacks by Muslims since the year, well, let's make it easy. Let's start since 2002. In 2002, well, actually, you know, I'm not going to start 2002. Uh, let's just start right here in 2004 because there's so many and I know you're not going to be able to, to see this so I'm just going to try to scroll through this I don't know you might can read that I don't know if I can, could read it all Saudi Arabia uh, June 6, 2004 here's the, here's the number now I'm going to scroll down to the end of the year this is, this is all 2004 2004 um, and there you see a total of uh, what is that, 1,066, 1,066 deaths in 2004 by Islamic terrorist attacks. Now, 2005, let's come down to 2005. 2005 hit a little off year. Uh, here's one, uh, this is uh, what, India, October 29th, uh, 2005, Netherlands, uh, October 
a couple people are killed there. Let's go back up here. Here's uh, 60 people were slain in Jordan on November the 6th. Uh, see, a lot of these things don't ever get reported. I mean, it's just like no one... It's, and really, because it's that would be the news cycle. I mean, can you imagine? Here's here's May 30th, 2006. Uh, or is that 2005? Not 2006. Uh, April 17th, April 24th. I mean, that would just be the, the constant news cycle. Just let me give you the, the bottom line here, friends. The bottom line. Just keep it scrolling here. The bottom line. These are all terrorist attacks uh, since, I guess you go back to the 70s. But this is just from 2002. These are the terrorist attacks by Islam and the, and the grand total uh, through 2016. All right, so we started 2000. If we start in 2002, go to 2016, talk about 14, 15 years. The grand total is is 13,490 people just from terrorist attacks. And we're supposed to believe that well, it's a it's a peaceful religion. Friends, let me ask you a question. I know that there are people who profess to be Christians who do bad things. They might, they might, on a slim possible chance, do it in the name of their religion. But I don't know very many that do. I haven't heard of many of them do. But all the individuals who are Muslims, and they do such heinous acts like this, they always do it in the name of Allah, the moon god. He's the moon god. They always do the name religion. When are we going to learn? I mean, has time taught us anything over the past 15 years even how dangerous it is to cater to such a religion? And you know, for our friends, there are, there are nations over in, the, uh, in, in, in Europe, like Poland, they don't have any problems. You know why? Because they don't let these individuals in. But you have people in Britain and France, open borders, right? Germany, they're coming in. They're, they're cowing down to them. Oh, we've got to be nice to them. Gotta be nice. Let's let all the Muslims in. And you know what? Now they're suffering the consequences. And so uh, here you have countries that are saying, no, wait a minute. This is too dangerous. Too dangerous just to let anybody and everybody come in, especially, especially when they're from predominantly Muslim countries that are uh, aggressive. What is what is it? Radicalized? Have we already learned anything, friends? Maybe we should take some time to learn some things about Islam. Do a little refresher course. I've known we've done, I've done TV programs, lessons on on Islam before, but maybe we need to. To go back and do it again. Listen, Islam is not a religion of peace. And, and it's time that we remind ourselves of this. And so contrary to what people believe, it's not a peaceful religion. Now here's, George Bush says all Americans must recognize that the face of terror is not the true face of Islam. Islam is a faith based upon love, not hate. That's a lie. President Bush, you don't know what you're talking about. President Obama said, I'm going to stand with the Muslims. He don't know what he's talking about. Maybe he does. I don't know. But I know that it's not in the best interest to cater to a religion that is not based on love. It's not based upon love. I know it's not based on love because it's not based upon the Bible. God is love. His word, his word is truth. And Islam is nothing like this book. All right, the Quran is nothing like this book. And the God of Islam is nothing like the God of the Bible. It's not the same. Don't, don't confuse Allah with the God that you read about in this book. Allah is a moon God. He is not the true and living God. All right? Now, here's what we need to realize about Islam. <clears throat> the idea that Islam and Christianity go together, I mean, it's as far from the east to the west. That, that's like oil and water. They don't, they don't mix. It, it's, it's, a, it's a false idea. The nature of any religion takes on the 
nature of the founder. So if we look and see what kind of man Muhammad was, the founder of Islam, we can know what kind of religion it is, what we should expect from the followers of it. Would that be the case? Because the disciples uh, are going to imitate the teacher. And, uh, and that's what we do. Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus was an example that worship follows, what Peter said. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 11 and verse 1, Be ye imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. So, if we're going to find out what Islam's like, let's look at, at the founder. Let's see what kind of man he was, and we'll find out what kind of religion we're talking about. Muhammad was a man of war. He wasn't a man of peace. Now, he might have been a man of peace at some point, but at, uh, and, and maybe in the beginning, but in the end, he was a man of war. He was a man of war. Uh, he lived under a tribal system. Each tribe defended its own. And attacking a member of one tribe meant you were attacking the other. And so revenge was just a way of life. That's, that's what they did. You attack me, I'm, I'm going to attack you. We're going to get revenge. Uh, the uh, uh, Kurarish, uh, Kurarish, or Kurarish, a tribe of, of Muhammad, participated in wars with neighboring tribes. Six hundred, in uh, 610, Muhammad receives a revelation from Gabriel. Now friends, think about this. This is how... All these false religious start. They always get some kind of revelation from an angel, right? Muhammad gets a revelation from Gabriel and tries to get uh, his tribe to worship God and put away their many gods. But his tribe rejects him and, he tries, to, and tries to kill him. And so he flees to Mecca. All right, he flee, flees to Mecca, town of Medina, in 622. Now this is where it starts. This is where it starts. In Mecca, he gets a new revelation. He gets a new revelation, and Allah's words come to him. In Medina, in Medina, the revelation changes. He goes from peace to revenge. He goes from from war, from peace to war. All right. So while he's in Medina, he's getting a message from Gabriel saying, "Hey, let, you know, you need to worship true living God." When he flees, when his, when his uh, family and tribe reject him, try to kill him, off he goes. And now he's changing it. See, the revelation from these false prophets and false teachers and founders of false religions always change to accommodate them or to accommodate their interests. And so that's what you have. Now, so when you read through the Quran and you're reading some things that that happened to Muhammad while he's at Mecca at Mecca yeah it may sound peaceful but when you get to Medina <clears throat> or excuse me when you get to uh, I'm going to send it backwards yeah when you get to Medina it, it's you know it's all war so uh, here's something you need to learn about Islam Islam practices situational ethics now what do you mean situational ethics in other words depending on the situation depends on what's right and what's wrong <clears throat> uh, Muslims attack the caravan, a caravan, and uh, uh, Muhammad refused the, the loot. No, no, we're not going. We're not going to. We're not going to spoil the caravan. But notice, as new revelations come in, it's like, wait a minute, maybe we should take that. Now, Muhammad's rules change. Islam's rules change, and. Looting was okay. Here's what here's what the surah say, here's what the Quran says in uh, Surah two seventeen. It says they ask thee concerning fighting in the prohibited month. Say fighting therein is a grave offense, but graver is it in the sight of Allah to prevent access to the path of Allah, to deny Him, to prevent access to the sacred mosque, and drive out its members. Tumult and oppression are worse than slaughter. Alright? So, if you're going to be uh, oppressed or whatever, it's better if you just kill. Slaughter. So now we're saying, well, now it's okay to uh, 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 spoil thing that, that will help Islam. And friends, this is why I say, when, when, when Muslims say, oh, we're peaceful, when you hear the, the members of, of CARE, the uh, uh, 
the Center for American and Islamic uh, Relations, a very radical group, when you hear them say, well, we, we, we're all peaceful, just remember, under Islam, it's okay to lie in order to get your way, to promote Islam. The rules of Islam, well, you can lie to promote Islam. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't trust anybody that's telling me Islam is peaceful. If I know that, hey, they can lie if it means promoting Islam. So that right there can give you some, some understanding about what we're dealing with. Are we learning anything? The people are saying, oh, it's peaceful, it's peaceful. But here what we're seeing is not so peaceful. Are we learning anything? Talk about the books of Islam. The books of Islam, you have, number one, you have the Quran. The Quran supposedly are words that were revealed to Muhammad. I say supposedly because they were all written down in little bits and fragments and bones and scraps and whatever. And so uh, anybody could say it's uh, something Muhammad said. So we don't know for sure. But a hundred, over a hundred verses uh, in the uh, Quran command fighting against unbelievers. All right? So when someone says it's peaceful, are you learning anything? Learn something from the Quran. What does it say about itself? Here's an example. Uh, chapter 47, verse 4. This because those who reject Allah follow vanities, while those who believe follow the truth from their Lord. Thus does Allah set forth for men their lessons by similitudes. Therefore, when ye meet the unbelievers in fight, smite at their necks. At length, when ye have thoroughly subdued them, bind a bond firmly on them. Surah chapter 9, verse 73 says, O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be firm against them. Their abode is hell, a refuge, an evil refuge. Indeed. So when someone says, well, the, the Quran doesn't command it. Well, it does. It does. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, let's, uh, it's a book that actually encourages war, and that's why you have individuals like uh, Osama bin Laden who quoted extensively from the Quran as his authority or as his motivation uh, for doing what he did. I mean, he quotes from the Quran to justify this is what I'm doing. Now, does this sound like it came from God or the Bible? Listen. Muhammad said, fight if they reject your message. Fight if they reject your message. Jesus said, let's look at Matthew 10, verse 14. Matthew 10 and verse 14. Whosoever shall not receive your words, nor hear you, uh, not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Muhammad said, fight against them. They reject your message, fight. Smite their neck. It, at, at, you know, at least subdue them and put them in, in bondage. Jesus said, if they don't receive your words, the words that I'm giving you, they don't hear you, don't receive, don't receive your word, hey, it's going to be on them. It's going to be on them. So, does that sound like the same kind of religion? Does it sound like the same uh, author, if you will? Muhammad said, persecution is worse than slaughter. What does Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 5, Matthew 5 and verse 11. Whosoever, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus said, count it a blessing. Count it a blessing when you're persecuted. Muhammad said, persecution is worse than slaughter. In other words, it's worse to be persecuted than for me to slaughter. So he went around killing everybody because that was better than 
someone persecuting him. Jesus said, no. Peter said, if you suffer as a Christian, right? If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Why is it? Why is it that Muhammad said persecution is bad? Jesus said it's good. Jesus said it's a blessing. Could it be because the source of the Quran, the source of Islam, is totally different than the source of Christianity and the source of Christ? Now, here's another authoritative what authoritative uh, record for for Islam? The Hadith. These are the traditions of Muhammad, and they're stories that supposedly were told by the Prophet or of the Prophet about the Prophet, and uh, it's really kind of a, an explanation of the situations that you find uh, to explain verses in the Quran. All right, so maybe it's kind of like a I don't know if this would be right, uh, accurate to say a commentary on the Quran. You have the verses in the Quran and you have the Hadith that, that explain maybe the situation that took places where uh, uh, the Quran was written. The background of the verses of the Quran. Uh, and they're just as authoritative as, as, as the Quran. Uh, notice this. The, the Hadith talks about war again. Uh, in uh, Bukhari... Chapter 1, verse 25. Allah's apostle was asked, What is the best deed? He replied, To believe in Allah and his apostle, Muhammad. The questioner then asked, What is the next in goodness? He replied, To participate in jihad. To participate in jihad in Allah's cause. So the best deed... The best deed is to believe in Allah and Muhammad. The next best deed is to engage in jihad. To engage in jihad. That's the best thing. Now Jesus said, the greatest commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Here, Muhammad, love Allah and, uh, and Muhammad, and... Then go kill people, I guess you might say. Uh, here's another one. The messenger of Allah said, There is another act which elevates the position of a man in paradise to a grade 100, and the elevation between one grade and the other is equal to the height of the heaven from the earth. He said, What is that act? He replied, Jihad in the way of Allah. Jihad in the way of Allah. Friends, are we learning anything? Can you look back over the past, what, 15, almost two decades? 15 years, almost two decades, and say, you know, I'm learning something about Islam. It's really not peaceful. I'm learning something about Islam. They really don't want to dwell peacefully with everybody else. They really don't want to tolerate anybody else. Their idea of toleration or tolerance is for you to agree with them. And then they'll tolerate you. That's, that's, their, that's their, their idea of tolerance. Here's another statement from... Uh, the Hadith. A journey undertaken for jihad in the evening or morning merits a reward better than the world and all that is in it. Holy war. Holy war. A man came to Allah's apostle and said, Instruct me as to such deed as equals jihad in reward. In other words, if there's something I can do and get the same reward as if I participated in jihad. And he replied, this is Allah's apostle, replied, I do not find such deed. Nothing equals jihad as far as the, 
the, the degree of reward. If you really want the best reward in, in Islam, hey, go to a go to a concert and blow you and twenty other two people up. You really want you really want to get to heaven? You really want the greatest reward in Islam? Hey, go blow a building up. Go fly a plane in a building. You really want the greatest reward? Hey, Allah Akbar, go shoot up people. Go to the mall and start shooting people. Go to your workplace, start shooting people. Shout out Allah Akbar. Hey. Now friends, are we learning anything? Is time really teaching us anything about Islam? Listen, if we don't pay attention to what has been happening and we're not learning from the past, we are going to be doomed and find ourselves suffering greater things because we didn't pay attention. We didn't learn. I want you to consider what Islam teaches to those that find themselves under its thumb. All right? Those that find and understand. Here are the choices that Islam gives you. So if you're not learning a lesson, if we're not learning a lesson, and we're too busy tolerating and bowing down and cowing down to, to uh, uh, individuals because we don't want to hurt their feelings, no one does that to the Catholics. No one does that to uh, Christianity. You know? But all oh, but Islam, well, are you learning something? Let me tell you something. In Islam, you've got three choices. You can accept Islam. You can pay a tax. It's called a jizya. Pay a tax. That's for non-Muslims. Or you can go to war with Muslims. Now, that, that's the three choices. You can just accept Islam. You can convert. You can pay a tax. Or you can go to war. Now, friends, I don't know about you, I'm not converting to Islam. And I pay enough taxes. So the question is, are we going to go to war? Now friends, I'm not saying go shoot somebody. But I'm saying we have to go to war in some way to stop this. Put it into to, to stop the tide. And the best way, the best way is to go to war this way. See, the best way is to go to war this way. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, when you talk about these three choices, convert, pay the tax, or go to war, here's what you have. Now, you say, well, I don't know if anybody does this. Oh, they're still practicing in some countries, in, in the countries that are uh, strictly uh, Islam. They're practiced. And if you don't think it'll be in this country, what do you think will happen when all of these so-called these cities that are allowing uh, no-go zones and allowing uh, Muslims to enact Sharia law, what do you think will happen when those spread? What do you think is going to happen? Listen, it'll take over. Our, it'll be a form of government that takes over. Now, are we going to be tolerating it? Are we learning anything about what tolerating an invading form of government under the guise of religion is going to bring us? Are, are, you, are, you, are you paying attention? Are you learning a lesson? Here, here's, here's, the, here's the consequences. <clears throat> if a person doesn't convert to Islam, they become part of the uh, Demi. All right, that's D-H-I-M-M-I. Demi, Demi, Demi. And basically, this is a second class, you're a second class citizen. You're living in a Muslim state under Muslim law, Muslim rule. And basically, they're just, that's, their, that's the best they're going to do to tolerate you. Uh, the, uh, the person who submits to Islam, or excuse me, the person who, who pays the tax and becomes part of the demai. And I don't know if I'm saying it right. And, uh, but you can look it up and see how it's pronounced. <clears throat> Have fewer legal rights than regular citizens. Or you're a second class citizen. Jews and Christians uh, are called, called uh, people of the book. 
Islamic law calls them demis, which means protected, or guilty. They, you're paying a tax. You're paying a tax. And you can't you, you can't do what you think you might be able to do. You know, you don't have any freedoms, no liberties. They're protected because they receive uh, revelations from Allah, but they're still guilty because they're considered to have corrupted these revelations. That's why when you talk to a, a, a Muslim and talk about the Bible, well, this Bible, it's, it's God's Word. It's the truth of God's Word. And... Really, they treat it like the Mormons do. You know, well, in as much as it's translated correctly, they'll say it's corrupted. It's corrupted. You need you need Muhammad. Well, the Muslim, the Mormons say you need Joseph Smith. That's another lesson. So, really, you're a second class citizen, and uh, you're not equal to to Muslim, even though you supposedly believed in in God. You got a revelation from God. <clears throat> Here's what the Quran says. He it is who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth that he might cause it to prevail over all religions. So Islam is going to prevail over all religions. So if you say, well, I'm not going to convert. I'm just going to pay the tax. I'm going to live in servitude. This is what you're talking about. Uh, now, you can practice your religion, but it's very, very strict, restricted if it's even allowed at all. Uh, you pay the tax, here's what happens. You, uh, you are not permitted to, now here's, here's what it says, when you agree to this pact to sign this tax, it says, you cannot erect a monastery, church, or a sanctuary for a monk nor restore any place of worship that needs rest restoration, nor use, and if them for the purpose of enmity against Muslims. So if you worship in a place that needs repairing, you can't make it. Can't restore it. And it can't be used to convert or speak against Islam. Just can't be do it. All right? Now what this what this pact does, this agreement does, it allows Muslims or Islam to well we'll take your property if we need to. They can seize their property. Well, you said something against the the prophet, so we'll take your property. Uh, the agreement to pay the tax and submit to uh, uh, being a citizen under Islam rule includes hosting any Muslim for three days. So if they come knocking your door, we need a place to oh, we got, got to let you in. Not preventing anyone from embracing Islam. So you can't tell your family member, your friend, hey, you don't need to convert to Islam. No, nope, that's prohibited. Uh, move and sit any elsewhere if a Muslim wants that seat. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I think we went through a period uh, in the history of the United States where... That was a civil rights thing, right? You don't get to make someone get up and move just because they are a certain type of person. Now, is this? Are we learning anything from history? We we can throw everything away, all the progress that's been made as far as civil rights uh, goes. We're going to throw that away because. We're going to tolerate and not learn from Islam, the truth, the truth of Islam. If a Muslim wants a seat, he can take it. You cannot raise voices in reciting holy books inside churches in the presence of Muslims. So a Muslim comes in to your place to a place where you're worshiping. You all you you can't quote the Bible and pound the pulpit. No. Can't try to convert them. Can't try to convert them. Are we learning anything? Are you learning anything? Now, here's the condition set forth. In uh, promise for protection. That's basically what we're talking about here. 
Remember the goal of Islam. Fight those who believe not in the law, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth. Even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the goal of Islam, this so-called peaceful religion, is really to subdue and humiliate everyone who is not, who will not convert to Islam. So I guess you're lucky if they don't chop your head off. But if you agree to submit, you're submitting in humiliation. You're submitting, and you're saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to speak against Islam. Friends, this is where we're coming from. Are, are we learning anything? Non-Muslims can convert, but Muslims can't convert out. In uh, 1651, over 400 Christians became Mohammedans. Because they could not pay their tax, which is the tribute that the Grand Signor levies on Christians in his states. The following year, the demise were forced to sell their children to the Turks to cover the debt. That's what history records. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but it seems to me like. If you take away the players, if you take away Islam, Muslim, and you put in other things of history, it sounds a lot like an oppressive government taxing people to the point that they're in debt. And uh, if the government wanted to, wanted to house someone, uh, they could just take over your house. Does that not sound like the, the revolution that was fought to established the United States of America? I mean, England did that. England sent their troops over, and if, if they said, we're going to take your house, and we're going to quarter here, and this is where uh, we're going to house our troops, you said, hey, 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 okay. If they said you're going to do something, you're going to do it. Are you learning anything, friends? Are we going to repeat history? Are we going to learn anything? And you think, well, that's not the Islam of the day. Yeah, it's, it's alive and well. In Iran, Christians from a, uh, form a minuscule 4% of the population. The tiny Christian population has been treated as second-class uh, demise who are theoretically protected while officially marginalized. The printing of a Christian literature is illegal. Converts from Islam are liable to be killed. And most evangelical churches must function underground. In 1999, uh, Sheikh Youssef Sal Salami, the Palestinian Authority's Undersecretary for Religious Endowment, praised the idea that Christians should become demise under Muslim rule. Are you learning anything from history? Now someone might say, well James, here you're talking about Islam, you're not very tolerant. You're kind of intolerant of other religions. You know, how are you different from Muslims? Because Muslims don't seem to tolerate other religions very well. How are you different? Well, here's the difference, friends. If you don't agree with me, I'm not going to cut your head off. I'm not going to put on a suicide vest and blow, blow somebody up. My warfare is with this. This is the sword I take up. Ephesians 6.17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're trying to win hearts and minds by wage, waging warfare on a spiritual level. See, this is why we have a standing invitation. Any denominational preacher, even if he's a Muslim, if he wants to come on and have a discussion, a debate about the merits of his religion or what he believes, he's welcome. He's welcome. See, we're waging warfare on a spiritual plane, a spiritual warfare. 
Because if we can if we can win the hearts and minds of people, it'll put a stop. It'll put a stop to Islam. There won't be anybody to convert to Islam. Now, do you really think that, that the Church of Christ is like Muslims because we are intolerant of other people's religions? Friends, if you want to be a Baptist, Methodist, whatever, that's your choice. I'm going to tell you that God is going to condemn you in the end. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but by me. And the church is the body of Christ. Now please tell me, how can you get to heaven going through Christ but not going through his body? It's the church. The church of Christ. And to say that you don't want to be a part of the church of Christ or you don't want anybody to know that you're part of the church of Christ is to say you really don't want to get to heaven. Now, I can't make you. I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to twist your arm and get to to uh, uh, get you to convert. I'm not going to force you to pay a tax if you don't convert. I'm not going to cut your head off if you don't convert. But I'm going to say, in the end, God's going to do a whole lot of work to you if you don't. But the choice is yours. Now, I'm not saying I don't care whether you obey or not. I do care. But in the end, I can't, I can't make you. I can't make you do something. See? See? The acceptance of the gospel is whosoever will. Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Whosoever. It, it's, not, it's not about me twisting you. John uh, twisting your arm in John 12, verse 48. John 12 and verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You want to reject the word of Christ? That's your choice. I wish you wouldn't. I wish you wouldn't make that choice. I hope that you will change your mind, that you will obey the gospel before it's too late. But you know what? I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to force you. Christianity is based upon man's free will, not his forced will. Now, what are you going to do? Are you learning anything from the past? Are you learning anything from the past? In Romans 6, 17, Romans 6, 16 and 17, Paul said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether it be whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that ye were uh, the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. See, God wants you to obey from the heart. He's not saying if they don't obey, put a, put a sword to the neck, strike them at their neck. No. You, you get a choice. You get a choice. Listen, when, when people rejected Christ, he didn't say kill them. He didn't say kill them. Look at this in, in Luke, Luke 9 and verse 52. Here's what Christ said. He sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know what? If you don't want to accept the gospel, render obedience to it, that, that's your choice. We're not going to call down fire from heaven. We're not going to wage jihad on you. We're going to fight against the doctrine. We'll try to destroy your doctrine, undermine it, expose it as 
doctrines of devils as opposed to the truth of God's word. But as far as forcing you to obey the gospel, no, friends, we're not going to do that. Christ said, whosoever will. Now, Muhammad, Muhammad, when he was rejected, here's what he said. The power of Abdul uh, Lahab will perish, and he will perish. His wealth and gains will not exempt him. He will be plunged in the flaming fire. His wife shall carry crackling wood as fuel. A twisted rope of palm leaf fiber round around round her own neck. He wasn't talking about a spiritual punishment. He was talking about actually being burnt in fire. Because he because his doctrine was rejected. Friends, what are you gonna do? Are you learning anything from the past? Are we learning anything from the uh, the recent events in history? Are we paying attention to what's going on around us? Learn learn a lesson before it's too late. Friends, the, the religion you're in, it may not be Islam. But you know what? If you're in a, in a religion that's not in the Bible, you should learn a lesson from this lesson. Islam, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, you know what? They're, they're all not from God. And they will all condemn you in the end. Now, we've been preaching. We've been teaching. We've been trying to encourage you and admonish you to render obedience to the gospel. Friends, we want to help you. We love you. We want to help you. And we'll be glad to study with you to show you from God's word what you must do to be saved. And if we can do that, we want to do that. If we can help you, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for watching, friends. I hope you, we've learned something. Always remember to make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. And if we can assist you, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.